The defense tilled the soil and planted seeds in the garden they were building in the jurors' minds. Some of those may have even sprouted before the state rested. Those defense lawyers were smart. Their client? Not so much. Next, your honor, defense calls Mr. Richard Merrick to the stand. I do. Uh, Richard Vincent Merritt. And Mr. Merritt, where were you born? Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And did you grow up in Virginia? Well, initially, um, for the first three years of my life there, my father was in the Air Force. He was career Air Force. He actually retired as a, a bird colonel after 24 years of service. But at the time I was born, um, we were stationed there. I believe he was at the Pentagon. We stayed there for about three years. When I was three years old, we moved to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. Stayed there for another three years and went back to D.C. where we stayed until I was 13 when my father retired. And at that point, he took a job with McDonnell Douglas, which back then was one of the world's largest military aircraft manufacturers. Not only is he selling, he's using his father's respectability to do so. It wasn't necessary to explain his father's rank or how many years he served. It wasn't necessary to throw in the Pentagon. And note he says, I believe, and we were stationed at the Pentagon. Instead of giving this long narrative that's actually focused on his important father, he could have simply stated where he grew up. He could even have said they moved a lot because his father was military. And he didn't need to explain how big the company his father worked for was. We went and lived overseas in Saudi Arabia for two years. At that time, you could not attend school past the ninth grade in Saudi Arabia, so... Um, I came back and actually went my sophomore year at the Paideia School here in DeKalb County. And then my dad was transferred to St. Louis to company headquarters where I spent my junior and senior year of high school. So I moved around a lot. So what's your father's name? He went by Ken, but his full name was Robert Kenneth Merritt. And when did your father pass? He passed away in November of 2000. And obviously, your mother's name was? Shirley. Do you have a brother? I do. And what's your brother's name? Robert Kenneth Merritt II. And is there an age gap between the two of you? I'm nine years. Who's older who's younger? Uh, my brother would be the older one. Now, growing up, what was the dynamics of the family? Was it just the four of you? It was just the four of us. Um, as I just mentioned, we moved around a lot. That was primarily when... My brother had already gone off to college. Um, he was in college by the time I was third or fourth grade. So, um, but the dynamic when, when he was still around or came to visit was, you know, we had a very traditional conservative Southern military household. My father was, as I said, career military. He went on to be a successful businessman. Very traditional conservative Southern military household. Think about the ideas and images and values each of those words evoke and are intended to evoke. And another mention of his father's success. My mother sold real estate, was very good at it with her personality and natural intelligence. She was a, a star at it. And, um, you know, my brother and I, you know, we, we got along. Um, my father definitely ruled the roost. He was, he was the boss, but uh, my mother certainly um, had her say, too. It was definitely a partnership. Now, when did you guys move to 1590 Players Road? My parents bought that house in the summer of 1993. That would have been the end of my freshman year at the University of Georgia. Now, is that where you went for undergrad? Yes, I went to UGA. And did you graduate from UGA? 
major? I did. What did you major? I was a double major in English and political science, basically pre-law. And did you go to law school? I did. And where did you go to law school? I went to law school at Mississippi College School of Law in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, while you were in undergrad, did you meet a certain lady? I met a certain lady. Her name was uh, Janine Minicosi. I met Janine when she was a freshman and I was a junior. I'm about a year and a half, maybe a little bit more than a year and a half older than her. But we met through a, <clears throat> excuse me, we met through a mutual friend. Look at the expression on his face when he says pre-law. And how long did you date before you got married? Well, early on we, we dated off and on as, as kids do at Georgia, just enjoying the, the scene there in Athens. But as I proceeded into my senior year, it was like a spring quarter of my senior year, getting ready to graduate, uh, we became more serious and decided we wanted to stay in a committed relationship. Now, by the time, what year did you get married? We got married in 1999, about a week after I graduated law school. And during that time, was she a, a veterinarian yet? No, she, I believe she started her first year of vet school, either my second or third year of law school because she was still had a couple years to go when I graduated law school. Now, by this time, when you got married, was your, was your father still around? Yes, he was. And what year did he pass? 2000, about a year after we got married. So during this time, did your mom help you out? Yeah, they both did. Um, at the time, I, you know, I, I took me Three attempts passed the bar. I passed it the third time. I failed the first two times. I did thankfully have a job as a project manager with a local internet company, so I didn't have the pressure of needing the license, although it certainly would have been nice to, to get that under my belt right away. But yeah, there were times when, when my parents helped us here and there while she was still in school, sure. He does two things here when talking about failing the bar. He admits it. Admitting to something everyone already knows about may make some people more likely to believe he's honest. And admitting to a failure makes him more human, more relatable, a more sympathetic character. The other thing he does with this is minimize its importance. Uh, it doesn't really matter because I had this other important job, project manager. So I didn't need it anyway. After your father passed, what were the relations between you and your mother? Well, after my dad died, it was, as you can imagine, just my brother and I and our immediate family. We are close to a lot of extended family, had a lot of close friends. But in terms of our family, it was obviously just my brother, mom and I, and uh, we were close. The question was about him and his mother. And it sounds like he answered it, but he actually didn't. Notice that instead of directly answering the question, he launches into a narrative, brings up other relatives and friends. He's been trying hard not to display adapters in front of the jury. But when he says, our family, he's scratching his nose. Immediately after saying, we were close, he's literally spitting those words out of his mouth. See that tongue? And note the, we were close, is in relation to the whole family, not him and his mother. What year did you and Janine get married? 1999. And did the two of you have kids? Yes. The firstborn is uh, our son Jack, uh, and our secondborn is our daughter Mia. Now, Jack, you've heard a little bit about him. Were you involved in his life? Absolutely. Jack was the kind of son that, that every father wants to have. He was smart, he was a sensitive kid, he was creative, he was, he was handsome, he was athletic, he was everything you wanted somebody to be. Um, 
just a, a real strong, special child. And he was my pal. I mean, we did everything at an early age. We went fishing. When he got older, we played a lot of golf. We went on trips, father-son trips. We went on trips with other dads and their sons that we were friends with. Um, I went to all of his school activities, helped coach his baseball team, uh, helped out with, uh, with football. Um, as I said, it, it was those big things that brought us closer, but it was little things as well. Um, just going to Target or hopping in the truck and going for a drive or, you know, things of that nature as well. Now, Mia, I understand she has a disability. What's her disability? Yes, Mia has cerebral palsy, and we did not know that she had a disability until she's about a year or so old. She was not... When they bring up his daughter, he again can't control his hands. You see him catch himself, then just lock down on the table with his forearm. Reaching her milestones as the pediatrician wanted her to, and upon further testing, they realized that she had a uh, form of cerebral palsy. So you and your wife have to put her in programs right now? Yes, I mean, she required special schooling, special therapies. As she got older, she required speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. She had a, a, a walker and a wheelchair at a young age, and obviously as she grew bigger and taller and stronger, she had bigger walkers and bigger wheelchairs. But she's always going to require the aid of one of those devices and always going to require therapy. She's had a couple surgeries to help her perhaps walk better. She, she can't walk without the aid of a walker. And her speech is slurred, and her development is delayed. Now, were you involved with her therapies and, and progress along with your wife? Yes, as much as I could be. I mean, when I opened my firm in 2002, as you can imagine, it was extremely busy. I was running my cases, trying to get new clients, uh, attending court. It was just me to start off with. So those early years, I couldn't be at every single thing. Um, that was the case when I was at a large firm before I opened up my own firm. So. I went to everything I, I reasonably could, but certainly I couldn't be at everything. But the things I couldn't attend, we certainly talked about after the fact because I wanted to be involved in her life. And you mentioned your practice. What type of law did you practice? Well, in 2010, um, I opened up my own law firm. And before that, I had been at a large law firm in Buckhead. But I've always been a litigator, primarily civil litigation, mainly personal injury. Uh, wrongful death, medical malpractice, and business litigation. When I opened up my own firm, I also did a little bit of criminal defense. I really didn't do felony work. I did a lot of DUIs, things of that nature. Now, during this time, around 2010, and as the practice grew, what type of lifestyle were you and Janine leading? When the firm opened in 2010? Mm -hmm. Well, we were a very sociable couple. We lived in a very... Uh, diverse neighborhood in Smyrna with a walking distance to downtown Smyrna where a lot of the restaurants and, and whatnot were at. The neighborhood was primarily people like us, two professionals, small kids. So there were a lot of children the same age as our children's ages. We got together for barbecues. We went to events together. We had each other over at each other's houses. There were a lot of sleepovers for the kids. The kids played baseball together. Uh, in the local Smyrna Little League. So there's always something going on, whether it was a neighborhood event or going to some sort of lawyer event or an event, an event associated with her veterinary practice. We were, we were out and about. Now, by this time, the father's passing, did anyone else live at 1590 Planter Grove besides your mother? No. And up until her death, did anyone else live there? Besides you? No, no. Now, during this time, 2010, 2015, what, were, what was your relationship with your kids and your wife? Uh, in 2010? 2010 to 2015. How was the family dynamic? The only way to describe my family dynamic and my marriage was it was it was a dream. We were happy. We were fun-loving. We laughed a lot. You know, Janine and I did a fair amount of traveling. Um, 
We were always doing things with the children. We didn't like to sit around and watch TV. We weren't that type of couple. We weren't sedentary by any means. Um, I was always trying to promote her career, and she was promoting mine. A lot of times we'd find out that we had clients in common and didn't even know it. And um, it was just a very idyllic way to live, to be married and to, and to raise kids, to be in a place that you enjoyed, around people you enjoyed, and to, to be building something, to be building a future. Still selling an image. In the next clip, watch his hands. Watch the timing of when he rubs them. Now, in 2018, what happened? In 2018, I was arrested in Cobb County for multiple counts of theft, forgery, and uh, there were some counts also of elder exportation because I did steal money from some elderly folks. Now, your arrest, was that a big deal in Cobb County? Yes, it was a big deal in Cobb County. Um, just a little bit of background. I was one of the few lawyers in Smyrna, and Smyrna has grown a lot since I started my practice in 2010, but it was right on the little village square across from the courthouse. Here we go with another narrative again. The question was whether his previous charges were a big deal in the community. The answer is yes. Can we get a yes? No. We get a narrative that includes an image of a small town and a village square, and this posture is working for him. He's looking at the jury and leaning there like he's having a conversation at a kitchen table. I'm surprised he hasn't thrown in kitchen table or apple pie. Uh, I was the only firm there that was part of why I picked that area, because I saw a need. I wanted to be the local lawyer that people went to first for help. He didn't see a need. He saw an opportunity. There's nothing wrong with saying you saw an opportunity for your business. Oh, but I suppose he has to stay away from saying he saw an opportunity, considering he saw an opportunity to steal from vulnerable and injured people and exploited that. Yes, I correct myself. I can't say opportunity. And it was a very successful vision. And um, so the practice grew. And when things went south quickly and I got arrested several years later in 2018, uh, it was a shock to our neighbors, the local community, and to, to the Cobb County Bar. Now, when you got arrested, how many times did you get arrested? Actually, the first time I got arrested in connection with the Cobb County fraud was in April of 2017. It was shortly after spring break that year. We had just gotten back, and I had a letter from the Cobb County Magistrate Court telling me that I needed to appear at a warrant application hearing. It was a successful vision, not a successful business. They're buzzwords. He says things went south quickly when he got arrested. Not before or during the time he was stealing from people. Now we hear that 2018 wasn't his first arrest. And once again, he's launching into a narrative. His pitch and inflection here tells you he's about to tell you a story in which he was either innocent or bewildered or somehow hard done by. And what that basically means is somebody has taken out a warrant for your arrest and a judge has to determine if there's probable cause or not. So this hearing was on a Monday morning and I went to the hearing. It happened to be two of the older ladies who were victims in the main arrest uh, in January of 2018, they had taken out a warrant for one th account of theft by conversion, alleging I'd stolen $70,000 of their settlement money. We had the hearing, and the judge found that there was probable cause. So the judge said, well, I'm going to set your bond at $2,000, and I will give you until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to appear at the Cobb County Jail. I left court, 
when I saw Janine that night, I told her as soon as I saw her after the kids were in bed, I said, I need to tell you something. She said, what? I said, I have a warrant for my arrest. And I explained to her what it was. I said, I don't know the extent of it. I know they're claiming I stole $70,000. Need to figure out more about it. But in the meantime, I need to appear at the Cobb County Jail tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Two of the victims from the arrest that happens one year later had gone to the court to seek remedy. He lied to his wife here. He told her someone claimed he stole money, that he needed to find out more about it, like he didn't know. And so the next morning, she went with me early to James Bond Bonding Company, one of the bonding companies up there off of County Services Road, and we filled out the bond paperwork. She was the surety on the bond and paid the 200 some odd dollars down, which is the 10% of the 2000. And I turned myself into the Cobb County Jail shortly before nine o'clock and was out by two o'clock that afternoon. So the first time. His wife believed him. And why not? She stood by him. So her leaving him when she found out he was lying about the whole thing is not strange. When he says he was out by 2 o'clock that afternoon, he speaks like, that's it. End of story. It's fine. Because he was fine. He was free. So, it's fine. She bonded you up. Correct. Um, Janine knew that I had been accused of a felony theft. She knew that I had booked in and out of the Cobb County Jail. And that was the last we ever discussed it until I was arrested along with everybody else, all the other victims, I should say, in uh, January of 2018. And all this about his wife. What does it have to do with whether or not he killed his mother? Nothing, except trying to discredit her testimony. But it wasn't her testimony that was so harmful to him. Image and anger. Smoke and mirrors, my friends. Smoke and mirrors. So the second time, did she provide any assistance to get you out of jail? No, she did not. Uh, to say she was less than pleased would be a, a vast understatement. Um, I was driving to deliver papers to somebody the morning of January 31st, 2018. Uh, several months earlier, I had voluntarily surrendered my bar license um, the bar had been investigating this. I knew what was coming, and it was just odd to me that I had never received an invitation from a detective to talk about it or anything like that. They just built their case, and then... He feels the police treated him unjustly. If they have all of the evidence, they're not required to hear from him. He knew he was being investigated. If he had an explanation that he wanted to provide... He could have called them. Of course, he didn't have anything for them because he did the crime. But apparently he has some idea in his head about how they ought to treat him. And they didn't do that. So he's the victim. And hey, what was the original question here? Oh yes, his wife didn't support him. Wham, there it was. So that's how they chose to proceed. But I was arrested on um, January 31st. I was, as I said, going to deliver some papers. A Cobb County Sheriff's Deputy SUV pulled up behind me, blue lighted me. I pulled over in a Taco Bell parking lot, and several unmarked uh, Crown Vicks appeared as well. I didn't learn until several hours later the scope and, and extent of what I was being charged with. I reached out to her from the jail. I knew based on my experience as a lawyer that I would not be bonding out in the next few weeks. And sure enough, did not have a formal bond hearing before a Superior Court judge until about two weeks later. But Janine was very upset, didn't understand what was going on, which is certainly understandable. It's interesting to me that the police found it necessary to do that kind of takedown. There's a reason. 
And Janine didn't understand what was going on because he deceived her. I frankly didn't know the extent of what was going on, although I had a pretty good idea. And that's that was her reaction at the beginning of the whole process. So that case, how many victims were there? There were 15 victims and 34 felony counts. About two weeks, maybe a little less. And did you end up having a higher word on that case? I did. And who's your lawyer? David Willingham. And were you able to pay him or, or did somebody else pay? At that time, uh, funds were extremely tight and limited. Um, I was in the Cobb County Jail. Janine was scrambling to try to make sense of what was going on and take care of the children. So my mother graciously offered to assist with his initial fee payment. And what was your mother's genuine demeanor and feelings at this time? My mother was upset. She was disappointed. She raised me better than that. And um, she had every right to be upset with me. It was a disgrace. And uh, there's no excuse for my behavior. But she was upset. But at the same time, um, I was her son. She truly did believe that one should hear out all sides of, of a situation before making an opinion. And she gave me the benefit of the doubt. And her goal was to help me get out. And then I would get a very stern talking to once out. But her goal at the time was just to support me and try to help me get up the bond money. How much was your bond? The bond was $400,000. The down payment for the bond in order to actually get me out was 10%, so that would have been $40,000. How was that? Been? My mother, it took about two months, but what she ended up doing was taking out a home equity line of credit, basically a second mortgage on her home, in order to come up with the 40000 So ultimately, how much time lapsed between your getting a bond and getting out of jail? I believe it was about 65 or 66 days. And what were the conditions on the bond? Well, the bond conditions were as follows. I was to have a curfew of 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., which meant, obviously, I had to be back at her address. I had to live at her address, first of all. That was the first bond condition. Second condition was I had a curfew of, as I mentioned, 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. So I had to be back by 5 p.m. and I couldn't leave to leave the next morning till, I'm sorry, it was 8 a.m., 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. Obviously, I had to reside at her home in 1590 Planters Row in Stone Mountain, DeKalb County. I wasn't to drink any alcohol, do any drugs without a prescription, not to break any laws of the state of Georgia, pretty standard stuff. They also had me surrender my passport within the first 24 hours of release, which I did, and I was required to wear an ankle monitor. Now, once you were released, what was the relationship between you and your wife? It was very contentious. Um, she felt that I had led a double life. She didn't understand why I took money from these people. Um, she was upset. She was shocked. We went from having an idyllic life to having nothing. Um, oh, despite my urges to try, it was decided that she didn't want to stay in the home, so we let the house go. It was a very nice house that we loved and had lived in and raised our children in and planned to stay in a long time. So the house was gone. Um, she decided to move into a rental home in East Cobb and Marietta, where the public schools are, are are quite good, and my son had attended the Lovett School, which is a private school, but he wasn't going to be able to go there anymore. My daughter went to public school because of her disability, so thankfully she could attend school wherever she wanted, um, based on having a disability. But it was a, it was a major upheaval. I mean, it, overnight it was as if a bomb went off in our lives. Yes. He was the bomb. His mother put up her house. His wife was shocked 
the reality of his crimes are hitting other people hard. Fifteen-ish victims? Ish? Everybody else is paying for his crimes. He mentions letting the house go. That's been too. They lost the house because he didn't make a mortgage payment for six months. He didn't pay the electric either. And we hear a lot of words coming out of his mouth. Words describing how he wasn't treated well. Words designed to soften bad deeds, to redirect, to build image. But what of the victims? What words of remorse do you hear? He wants the jury to empathize with him. But what about everybody he hurt? Saying, yeah, okay, I did it, is a statement of fact made after he was caught and couldn't get out of it. He doesn't even know how many people he criminally victimized. He also failed to mention he pawned the van his wife needed to transport his disabled daughter. And there's an awful lot of narrative here he's getting away with. And at some point in time, she filed for divorce. Uh, very quickly, she filed for divorce four days into my arrest. And did that divorce ultimately was it completed? Yes, the divorce was finalized, I believe, third week of June 2018. And I, I didn't fight her on the divorce. I understood her emotions. I understood the reasons uh, for it. Um, I certainly didn't want her to be accused of having any part of my misdeeds because I, I truly did act alone. Uh, she wasn't involved. I think early on some folks may not have believed that, but it turned out that the divorce not only was what she wanted emotionally, but uh, perhaps helped out in segregating, you know, my behavior from, you know, obviously her not having an involvement. Of course she filed for divorce. If you think about it, it wasn't that quick. He was first arrested in 2017, and he told her a lie about it, and she stood by him. When she saw the truth, yes, of course, out of one side of his mouth, you can hear his contempt for her. But out of the other side, he speaks as if he's the understanding protector and he's sacrificing for her. Now, after your release, what was your relationship with your kids? My son was 14, 14 and a half at the time. And as I said, we were very close. And he had me up on a, a pedestal like a lot of boys do their father and he was upset with me he yelled at me he ignored me he cried he, he was hurting it's about time somebody put a stop to this show the prosecutor is doing more here to protect the son than his own father is mr merritt is using his son's pain to humanize himself. I'm going to play the objection so you can watch his body language. We've heard from Dr. Minicosi and she went into detail about the things that the son felt, things that the son did, and things the son told her during this time period. But that doesn't make it relevant. So how is this relevant? So more. Look at the expression on his face when the judge says it's not relevant. He doesn't like this. What's your mother? By this time you're living with your mother. Yes. In your object. Correct. What was your relationship with her? She was she wasn't pleased with my behavior. Um, she was embarrassed. But at the same time, she was willing to give me a chance, give me a place to live, help me, help me survive. I mean, I, I really didn't have much other than my personal effects and an old pickup truck, literally. So 
she opened up her home to me and it was strange being back under her roof at I guess I was 43, 44 years old when all this went down. Um, but, you know, it, 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 after the first several days and weeks, you know, we got into a routine and it, it was fairly normal under the circumstances. Did you and your mother argue, fight? My mother's a very strong little person. I believe the term firecracker was used and that is a very good term. I would throw another one out there. She's a steel magnolia. My mother is a strong Southern woman, and she had no problem telling me what I thought, uh, what she thought rather down to what I wore, to my opinions on certain things. But it was certainly not toxic. We were both opinionated people. We spoke our minds. Um, but we also laughed a lot and spent a lot of time together. So I, it, there's nothing abnormal to me or her about it. criminal case made its way through the process. Um, did you start to feel some external pressures? You mean as we got closer to uh, sentencing. sentencing? Yes, it was, it was a very odd time. Starting in, I would say, right around the 1st of January 2019, my sentencing hearing had been set way back in September of 2018. Uh, I actually wanted to plea earlier and get on with it and get on down the road to prison, but... Notice how at the beginning of the clip, he gets himself back into his position, the kitchen table position. That's not a real term. I just made that up, but I think I'll keep it. Here we go. Another long story. And he throws in that he wanted to plea early, but because he's so responsible, but there's a but. The DA at the time in Cobb County wasn't ready yet. He wanted to make sure there weren't any more victims, which was fine. It's certainly his prerogative. So there weren't any more victims. And then the plea date was set for September. I'm sorry. In September, the plea date was set for January 18th of 2019, a Friday. And about, right about the 1st of January 2019, my mother's house kind of sits up on a cul-de-sac. And you can see the whole cul-de-sac. And I saw an abnormal amount of cars pulling slowly through, stopping in front of our home, uh, my mother noticed the same thing. I began receiving hang-ups on my cell phone, numbers I didn't recognize. Some said unknown number, but area codes and numbers I didn't know. My mother was receiving the same thing. She showed me her phone, just wanting to know if I knew who these numbers were, and, and I didn't. And this seemed to go on with some frequency uh, up until January 14th of 2019. If there truly was an unusual amount of activity, wouldn't the neighbors have noticed too? So we're going to hear from them about that, right? No. Oh, I see. He said the unusual traffic and hang-up calls went on until January 14th. Remember that. The homicide occurred February now, during this time, were you speaking with your wife? Yes, of course. And likewise, does she have concerns? I believe, you know, if I recall correctly, she did. Um, the, the victims in this case have been characterized, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, I'm just trying to answer truthfully and honestly. The victims have been characterized. This is the part I hate the part where the predator finds a way to characterize the victims. You know, the human beings the predator victimized. Oh, I could tell you stories, but there's no time for that. As... Objection, Your Honor. What the victims have been characterized as is not relevant. I don't know that's hearsay or where he's coming up with this, but I don't believe that that's 
And they're not victims in this case. There's no, only no. one victim in this case. Correct. So how is this I'm testimony relevant? I'm going to All right. I'll sustain the objection. Watch his expression the second she says objection. Now, were you ever supposed to follow? Yes. And did you ever feel that maybe somebody was out to get you? Absolutely. No doubt about it. Someone's out to get him. Absolutely no doubt about it. Oh, really? Based on what fact? Excess traffic? Earlier, we heard about a cartoon. But that cartoon was expressing sarcasm and concern that the justice system was going to fix everything for him. And it was sent before his sentencing. Once he was sentenced, the author of that cartoon should have been appeased. People being upset that you betrayed and exploited them is expected. If he or anyone else thought he was at risk, why not speak to authorities? If it's absolute and without a doubt. And wasn't he seeing his children during this time? If he feels someone is out to get him, why would he let his kids be in harm's way? There aren't many sensible answers to that question. And if all this ended on January 14th, how is he tying it to the February homicide? Now let's talk about, at some point in time, as we can see, that's in one, a cartoon rock. Yes. In where, what day is that? That was January 14th, 2019. And who received that cartoon? That cartoon was received at my mother's home at Planters Row in DeKalb County. It was personally delivered in her mailbox and discovered by her. Did you have discussions with her about it? Right away. I was, I believe, on my way to work. I was working at a warehouse at the time, and I received a call from her informing me of receipt of this cartoon and she was upset and literally as I hung up with her I received a call from my ex-wife Janine who you've heard from and she was upset and what was concerning to me because it was directed at me as well not only in the substance of the cartoon but obviously had to deal with something I was involved in in Cobb County. What concerned me was that these are copies of the same cartoon being delivered 40 miles apart, two different counties, with a county or two in between these counties. And it was a concerted effort, whoever delivered them. It's true that the two flyers being delivered 40 miles apart is cause to take a closer look. I suspect, though, that the reason for this is that the author or authors didn't know for sure where he was living and so delivered it to both addresses. And I don't believe he was worried. He says, it was directed at me as well. Deception again. It was directed at him only. He's trying to make it sound like his family was targeted and he's collateral. Uh uh. It's the other way around. Now, within a day or so, what happened to your mother? Well, actually, it started the night that she received the cartoon. Um, I got back and she was upset. Um, she started feeling dizzy, having difficulty breathing, having chest pain. Uh, and it's, she, she just was very concerned about the cartoon, about the effect on Janine and the kids. And I should add that Janine 
felt as if, um, well, she didn't feel, she was quite adamant that she was keeping my son Jack home from school the next day and she wasn't gonna go to work. And she had called somebody at the Cobb County DA's office or sheriff's office, and I'm not sure which, to inform them of it. And my mother was concerned that they weren't gonna do anything, and in fact, they didn't. Um, so there, there was definitely concern on, on both sides. My mother had these symptoms. She decided that she needed to go to the ER. Well, I had the ankle monitor on and the curfew had been moved back to midnight because I had started a job at Petco Warehouse up in Gwinnett County. And in order to, to make my hours, I had to be able to get the curfew moved back, which my pretrial officer, basically my probation officer was happy to do because they want you to have a job. So long story short, I wasn't still gonna be able to drive her because my mother really didn't make the decision to, to go to the hospital until probably 10, 30, 11 that night. There's no way I could take her there, drop her off and get back and not be in violation of my monitor, so. Is that true that people in that county are further than a half hour drive from the closest hospital? And why is he explaining all this about his job and curfew? Maybe it's because he knows he ought to have helped his mother, so he feels the need to explain why he didn't. And if she's dizzy and having chest pains, why no ambulance? This is a weird story, and there's no relevance to it except perhaps to say she was very upset about the situation. This is still January 14th, before he was sentenced. She was able to drive herself. They admitted her, and I think she was admitted at early morning hours of the 15th, and she was discharged sometimes on the 16th. Now, after she was discharged, did your mom still have concerns? It was all we talked about. Um, she got back home that Wednesday when I first encountered her. I remember distinctly sitting at the kitchen table. We were, we were a kitchen table family, so discussions were had at the kitchen table or around the, the kitchen counter around the island where... There it is, kitchen table, kitchen table family. The sink was. So we talked about it. And back a few days earlier on Monday, I had taken a picture of the cartoon on my phone and sent it to my lawyer, David Willingham, so he was aware. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he received a copy as well as something else. Um, that's speculative hearsay. I don't know that his personal knowledge of it. And, and Mr. Queen, this has turned into a lot of narrative. So you need to either ask some specific questions or instruct your client to confine his answers to the questions that are asked. So I'll sustain the objection. Yes, Thank you, Judge. So... What did your mother do in response to the cartoon as it relates to the attorney who's willing? She began to draft a letter to Mr. Willingham. And to your knowledge, was that letter delivered? To my knowledge, it was. On what day was this? What day is it? January 15, 16, 17? What day are we? I remember her showing me a draft of the letter quite soon after she got home because my mother was the type of person to handle stuff while I was fresh on her mind. So she showed me a draft of it. I said, do whatever you want, send it. And I, I have no reason to think that's not what happened, and, and, and it did in fact happen. Now, what day was your sentencing here? Friday the 18th. And how did that go? It was a quite an event. Um, court that day was to start at 9 a.m. and it lasted all day. Did you have a plea on that day? I did. Did the victim get an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the on that They certainly did. And the way it worked that day is I showed up and entered my plea. 
but there had not been an agreement on the precise sentencing. I rejected the state's initial offer. The judge assured us that he would not go more serious than that offer. So the hope was maybe I would end up getting a little less time than what the state initially recommended. The judge heard testimony from the victims all day. I believe I was the final person to testify. And then the judge pronounced his sentence 435 in the afternoon. He's mad at the victims. He had to sit in court all day long because of them. He had to sit there and hear their voices and see the judge listen to them. He doesn't say whether the judge gave him less time than what the state had offered. I think he thinks the victim's words influenced the judge. Now, you said you testified. Was it a trial? No, it was not a trial. I, I pled guilty in the first few minutes of the proceeding. The rest of the day was simply about the judge hearing from victims, hearing from me, and making a decision on what he wanted the sentence to be. There was no question about my guilt at any point. And what was the sentence? The sentence was 30 to 15. Plus, I had to pay back $526,000 in restitution. Now, did you go to jail that day? No, I did not. When were you report to the jail? The judge was gracious enough to give me two weeks to report, which would be February 1st by 5 p.m. at the Cobb County Jail. And he made it abundantly clear what would happen if I did not show up. What would happen if you didn't show up? If I did not show up, he would revoke my sentence and it would be a serve 30 sentence, which could affect, it could affect parole and all sorts of other things. So the sentence would be much harsher if I did not appear as scheduled and ordered. So you flee to Nashville, change your name, grow a beard, and find a PhD student to live off of. There's a country song in there somehow waiting to be written. So after sentencing, what did you do during this period of time between the sentencing and the day before the show up? Well, um, that day, um, just starting off with what, how it was handled. I mean, I, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't upset. I accepted my punishment, and my mother and I got in the car and we left and went back to, to her house in Stone Mountain. That weekend, we kept the kids. I spent time with my children, like I did a lot of the weekends during my 10 months out on bond. They wanted to see me. I wanted to see them. But he had people out to get him. Or is that only happening when it's convenient for him? So, so did you have an opportunity to spend time with the kids? Why are you going on even after you took your plea? Absolutely. That was, that was an area where Janine and I were thankfully in agreement. Um, she made it clear to me, both in and out of, out of the Cobb County Jail, during that 60 days I was trying to make bond, she said... Um, you know, if the kids want to see you, I have no problem with you seeing them. And I saw them above and beyond the former divorce settlement agreement. Um, there are many times that I kept them while she did things with her friends. And he's just got to throw that in there. He took the kids so she could be with her friends. Just got to add these tidbits. There really weren't any issues. We communicated and... If I wanted to see the kids and it worked out great, if not, then so be it. I'd see them next time. Now, your wife testified regarding the night before you returned to something. Yes. And did you, she mentioned that you went to a Starbucks. Did you meet her at the Starbucks? Yes. Um, my son, Jack, expressly wanted me to pick him up at his school in Buckhead that Wednesday and Thursday to try to get as much time together as we could. And I certainly complied with that and wanted to spend time with him. That Thursday, we went for an early dinner. I took him to the Longhorn Steakhouse in Kennesaw, up at Barrett Parkway. We finished kind of early. We walked around the REI Sporting Goods store because we both enjoyed outdoor things together. Mr. Mayor, you need to confine your responses to the questions that are asked. 
if you don't understand the question, ask that it be clarified. Yes, Your Honor. So when you met at Starbucks, were you already with Jack? Yes. And when your wife arrived, did she have a meal with her? She did. Was there any animosity between me and you? No. And let me go back for a moment. By this time, you were in the process of a divorce. Yes. Your wife mentioned about an incident. She says that you pushed her down. While you were out on bond, did you ever push your wife down? Absolutely not. The question was if he pushed her while he was on bond. No matter how the question is phrased, he's going to deny it. I do want to point out the phrasing, though. It's not, did you ever push your wife? It's, did you do it while you were on bond? Her testimony was that it happened before he was arrested. So, no. He wasn't on bond yet. So let's turn your attention to February 1st. Okay. That morning, did you go to your, doctor's, your daughter's doctor appointment? I did. Uh, Janine had told me about a pediatric neurologist appointment that my daughter had about, it was early. I think it was 8 a.m., maybe even a little bit before. And at that point in time, were you still on curfew? I was. So what time were you able to leave the house? I could not leave a second before 8 a.m. And the doctor's appointment, where was it? Sandy Springs. So what's the route you would take to get there from Planet Road? Well, really, the only way to go would be to leave the neighborhood, um, make a left out of the neighborhood, get back to Hugh Howell, get on 78, 78 to 285. Now, did you get there on time? Uh, it would be impossible to get there on time, but I got there as soon as I could. And were there any problems between you and your wife when you got there? No. Um, and did you get a chance to see me? I did. I did. I, you know, they were already seated with the doctor. Um, I walked in, said hello to everybody, gave me a hug, and sat down and listened to what the doctor had to say. Now, turn your attention to... This is to try to redeem him, to deny his weird behavior on the morning of the homicide. Should we trust the doctor who was so concerned about Mr. Merritt's behavior that he took the wife and child through the employee exit and stood there waiting until they were safely away? And the ankle monitor that shows Mr. Merritt was there for 18 minutes? Or... Instead, should we trust Mr. Merritt, who has consistently lied and deceived everyone around him? Hmm. Uh, Mr. Jeffco, what's your relationship with Mr. Jeffco? Mike is technically um, some degree of a cousin, but we come from a large family where, you know, we don't really get in all that, and I knew Mike my whole life, and we were close. And was there understanding for Mike to take you? Yes, um, I believe Tuesday or Wednesday that week, my mother and I decided that it would probably be best at, at that time when we had the discussion that Mike um, come and take my mother to, I mean, I'm sorry, take me to the Cobb County Jail. Now, is it that your mother didn't know how to get there? No, my mother had been to the Cobb County Jail plenty to visit me and to go arrange the bond. So... What caused things to change with that plan? Mr. Jeff Cote. Right. Uh, Thursday night, after I got back from seeing the children, uh, my mother and I were talking, and we just felt like it was a private family matter, an intimate family matter. Even though Mike was family, it was something that she and I wanted to share and handle. That was really all there was to it. We didn't want to inconvenience him. Oops. Thursday night. He didn't send the text until Friday morning, one minute after he got home from that weird interaction with Janine. So why doesn't he text Thursday night instead of inconveniencing the man by letting him get up and get ready in the morning? 
Sounds like on Thursday night, he was considering fleeing and thinking everything through. But he didn't solidify his plans until Friday morning, which is why he didn't send the text until then. So did you ask your mother to call Michael? We both decided that it wasn't necessary for him to be there. Why is that? Because we didn't want to inconvenience Mike, because um, we actually had a few things we wanted to talk about, and we, we just frankly didn't need anybody else's help. So the morning of the first, what time did you get back to the house? Oh, around 8.30, I think, somewhere in there, 8.30, 8.45. He says 8.30, 8.45. He also said he was late for the appointment because he couldn't leave the house before 8. His version is he drove to the appointment, sat in the appointment, and drove back in that amount of time. The ankle monitor has him at that doctor's office for 18 minutes, then driving home and arriving at 9.38. He knows this. And tell us what happened that day. So when I left the doctor's appointment and was driving back, I, it was the last time that I saw Mia uh, before I knew I had to turn myself in later in the day. Mia was my baby girl. She's my princess. So naturally, I was sad. Um, it was a sad ride home, just like the night before after saying goodbye to Jack. When I walked into, the way that you got back into my mother's house is that I would park my car in the driveway, her car was in the garage. If the garage door wasn't open, I'd open it and walk through the garage door into the kitchen. So I walked into the kitchen. I'm sorry? I was opening the garage door. The garage door opener. Did you have a separate garage door opener? Was it on the panel, on the door? No, no, it was in, it was in my car. Yeah. So what's your garage door? I, I went inside, and it had been obvious that I, I was upset. I had tears in my eyes, and she just came over and hugged me. She knew why. I was sad about saying goodbye to my children. And then what happened later that day? Well, shortly thereafter, um, we both, she sent Mike the text saying that things aren't so good here. And that's exactly what it was about. We were, it was just, just not a... Happy day. I mean, I was about to go into prison for possibly 15 years. So it was a private time. I, there was no yelling or screaming. I just. There was no yelling or screaming? What an odd statement. And, and I sent him a similar text, and that was that. So after those texts were sent, I started to go through some of my stuff and sort through some of my personal effects and. My mother and I, oddly enough, I had been so busy spending time with the kids and, and doing other things. She and I hadn't had a discussion about how to organize my clothes or, or what maybe to sell or, or any of that kind of basic housekeeping type of stuff. It, and those were things we needed to talk about. That, that's what we mentioned in the text when we said we need to discuss things. That's it. Now, is there a plan for y'all to have lunch together? Yes, my mother um, was a great cook, fantastic cook, and she was going to make spaghetti. So did she start preparations for lunch? Yes, she did. And then what happened? It was, you know, the plan was we were going to eat around 1 o'clock so that we could be on the road by 2, no later than 2.30. It was, I believe, Super Bowl weekend, Friday afternoon traffic, a bunch of stuff going on in Atlanta. And, you know, obviously we don't want to be late to the jail, given the importance of me being on time. I was walking from the kitchen. I had just left the kitchen from keeping her company while she was making the spaghetti when I heard a very loud knock at the front door. We weren't expecting any visitors. So I went to the front door and I opened it. And there were two individuals there, two men, and they both were pointing pistols at me. Look at him. He doesn't even believe himself. Well, now we know. Mick Melvo is a lousy writer. 
and they told me to let them in. So what'd you do? I let them in. I had never seen these guys before, and they were pointing pistols at me, so I let them in. I let them in, they shut the door. Uh, about this time, my mother came to the foyer where I was standing with these two individuals, and they said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. So the, the taller of the individuals, he was older, probably in his 50s, about six feet, athletically built, walked past me, put the gun at my mother's lower back, and she started to head towards the stairway to the basement. The fact they said head to the basement led me to think they knew we had a basement and had cased the house before. The younger of the men, he's probably about 5'8", five, 5'9", shoulder-length brown hair, pudgy. He put his gun on my back and we followed them. She opened the stair door to the basement, flicked on the light. It was a two. A fat guy and a skinny guy ride into town with their pistols. So I let them in the house, see? Come on! Remember how the defense attorneys have been carefully cultivating planting seeds, building their gardens in the minds of the jurors? Well, their client is flying over in a bomber. Two-step process to get down those stairs. You had four or five steps that went down, there's a landing, and then you make the turn, and there's the longer flight of stairs. They proceeded first. My mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. And as they made the turn on the landing and took those first few steps, by this point, I and the guy behind me who had the gun on my back made it to the landing. Oh, no. This is awful. Yes, the story is ridiculous. But he just disclosed something. His mother was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. His cadence and color change, in addition to the words, make me think that part is true. That's not a sound you hear every day, and most people who have never heard that wouldn't think to say it. I think Mr. Merritt heard that sound. He told her to shut the F up and pushed her down the stairs. Mr. Merritt pushed his mother down the stairs. She had an injury on her face that had to have occurred anti-mortem. I say that because there was a bruise. The ME said it was from blunt force. That injury wasn't the same as the ones from the barbell. I think he pushed her, and her face either hit the wall or the floor, but it didn't kill her or incapacitate her, so he had to go get a weapon. And then what happened to your it was the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. Um, she plunged headlong into the wall. It, it's a sound I can hear to this day as I'm sitting here. And I could tell that there was a dent or a hole in the wall. She was trying to get up and move around, but from my vantage point, she appeared like she couldn't get her balance. And she certainly appeared to be. And as I moved like I was going to try to go down the stairs, the guy dug the pistol into my back and grabbed my shoulder. The gentleman who pushed her down the stairs put his pistol behind his back into the, the back part of his jeans. He ran down the stairs, turned the corner, and came back with the 35 pounds weight that is been seen during the course of this trial. So when she tried to get up, Mr. Merritt ran for the dumbbell. The dumbbells he used. A stranger, even one who had been casing the place, would not have been able to quickly and directly go for that. That's aside from the fact that none of this makes any sense. Strangers with guns showing up, coming in, taking residents to the basement, no demands for valuables, no reason stated, 
if it was revenge, then they would have said so. Otherwise, it's useless. And intruders who are willing to kill will take out the biggest threat first. That would have been Mr. Merritt. I could go on all night with the long list of reasons why his story is trash. And so can you. We know Mr. Merritt ran for the dumbbell when his mom tried to get up. And where did the knife come from? Well, <laughs> the knife came later. Um... The knife came later? Translation. I forgot about the detail of how he got the knife, so let me buy some time here to think about it. This monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. And she was, she stopped moving at this point. He then told the man who had his pistol in my back to bring me down to the bottom of the stairs. They shoved me over to the tile. The guy who had his mother was wearing jeans. And the jeans guy was the leader? He told the other guy to bring Merritt downstairs? We all know this isn't true but I want to see if he keeps it straight. Then the other guy escorts Richard downstairs. I'm going to stop calling him Mr. Merritt now. That's his mother's name. How is the room at the bottom of those stairs for two men to get by her on the floor? There isn't. Notice there's no horror or anguish on his face. Some people do speak of such events with no affect, and they're not lying. But he does show affect, just not here. And what was he doing? Did he cry, try to negotiate, offer them money? You know he's a talker. People in such positions struggle with guilt, even when they could have done nothing. We don't see that. On home invasion calls, it's usually the men in the house whose worldviews are more shaken. They're shocked and guilt-ridden when they find they can't protect their families. Where the dumbbell rested, and then the older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife and proceeded to stab my mother repeatedly in front of me. I... I Cannot believe what I was seeing. I didn't understand what would be the purpose because she wasn't moving. The other guy ran up the stairs. Is this the jeans guy or the guy who had the gun on him? So there's this focused attack on this elderly woman. And these attackers are running around getting weapons, leaving Richard standing there. The shocking thing here is not the story. It's that he's actually telling it and thinking it's helping. Bombing the crap out of that garden. I think he's just going to crash the plane. He doesn't understand the purpose because she's not moving. I can tell him. Rage. He's a wound collector. And everyone had left him except her. And now, she wasn't going to let him flee and have her lose her home. To him, that would be a betrayal, the final one. So he took it all out on her, and that's why the overkill. And the attack on her face, he needed to obliterate her. Why is any of this happening? It was a complete and utter nightmare. So what did you do during this time? There's nothing I could do. I had a, a pistol to my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were or why they were doing this to us. So he stabbed her with such force that the handle broke off the knife. Wow. He's looking at his own hand as he describes the stabbing. I didn't realize at the time that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. He put the handle down. 
on the tile across from the dumbbell. He then turned and looked at me, and he pulled out his cell phone. And he proceeded to show me a picture of my ex-wife dropping Mia off at her school, a picture of Jack being dropped off or picked up at Lovett, a picture of them all getting out of her van at their rental home in Marietta, and a picture of her either coming or going from her clinic in Bynings. And he said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, if you say a single word, they're next. I had no doubt who they were or what next meant. He didn't wipe the blood off his hands before pulling out the cell phone and scrolling through it? Who needs to worry about details when you're setting up the next nonsense part of your bad script? And then they left. And then, did you call the police? No, I did not call the police. Why not? Because I just witnessed an unimaginable act of violence. Two unimaginable acts of violence. And then a man coldly look at me after he's standing over the body of my dear mother that he skewered and bludgeoned and shows me pictures of my family. He crashed the plane into the garden ages ago, but now he's telling us he's an ace pilot. Gotta protect his family. I don't remember hearing about him calling the kids schools in a panic, do you? What about anonymous calls to the police? No? So no, I did not call the police. How much longer did you stay there? I stood there numb and incapable of moving for what seemed like minutes. These guys had left. I went upstairs. All I could think about was Janine and the kids and what these monsters could do. And I went and got a small backpack out of my room. I put a few, few clothes. I didn't pack much some basic toiletries, and I left. Um, why did you take your mother's car? I took my mother's car because it had more gas in it than my car. It had a bigger tank, and I had no idea where I was going or where I was going to end up. And it seemed to me in that state of mind that at least her car would be easier to sleep in. And that's why I took her car. So where'd you go? When I left her house, um, I went out of the neighborhood. I don't even know what time of day it was when I left. But I went out of the neighborhood. I made a right and went up, I believe it was called Rockbridge, but it becomes Five Forks Street. And we're right at the DeKalb County, Gwinnett County line. And I made a left, I'm not sure if it was Arcata or Killian Hill, but up by the Kroger there, and just started heading towards 85. Now, how much time did it take you to get to Nashville? Is that where you go? You go straight to Nashville? No, no, I didn't go all the way to Nashville in one, one shot. Um, no, I... I ended up going to the QT station at Indian Trail in 85. I stopped to get a couple of bottles of water, some snacks. Um, I only had $18 cash on me. Um, Richard should have studied up on criminal profiles before coming up with this story. He would have known the profile of an assassin is different from a revenge killer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And where's the security camera footage from his neighbors showing a fat dude and a skinny dude with blood on them leaving the area? Or did they shower before leaving? And why did they leave a witness? And why attack her and not him? I'm not even, I don't even want to address his stupid story anymore. 
He committed the homicide in the order he described. Stairs, dumbbell, knife. He showered, packed a bag, turned off the stove, stole her cell phone, and left. I point out here that he has just admitted to being present at the time of the homicide. Now it doesn't matter that the ME couldn't give a precise time of death. That was the one thing his team could have worked with, but he blew that up too. I topped off the tank, I believe, put some gas in it, and then I proceeded towards towards Cobb County, towards 285 and then ultimately to 75. Why cut your monitor off? Well, the reason I cut my monitor off is I was concerned by the time I got north of Cobb County, you know, I was within, I believe, an hour or so of when I was supposed to report. I had no idea if just by routine the monitoring people were watching me or not. So that's why I headed towards Cobb County. I didn't want to do anything that would get me involved with the police because I didn't want it to come back to hurt my family if these guys found out and thought I had said something. Yeah, he wanted to escape. Now, why did you take both phones? For that very reason. I had every reason to believe, based on this horrific event, that these individuals had a lot of hate for me, had been following me and or my ex-wife and kids, and Perhaps they had our numbers. Perhaps they were the ones who had been calling and hanging up. I I didn't know. I I wanted to have the phones in case they had demands, if they went back to the house. Now, why would they call the mother's phone when they'd killed her? He didn't want that phone ringing inside the house. When people eventually tried to check on Shirley, they'd call and someone would hear the phone ringing in the house and know something is wrong. And he got rid of both phones. So this is more rubbish. And look at the puppy dog eyes while he lies. I had to know what was going on. And if Janine called either myself or my mother, I wanted to know what was going on with her, that she was okay, that the kids were okay. So that's why I took both phones. So how long did it take you to get to Nashville? Ultimately... I probably got to Nashville. I mean, I I think they're an hour behind, but I I ended up in Nashville after dark. Of course, it was wintertime, so it gets dark early everywhere, but it was probably 7, 8 o'clock Central Time by the time I actually got there. And why did you stay in Nashville? Nashville is a big city. I had no more money to buy gas. And it seemed like a safe place to pull off and park and try to figure out what in the world was going on. And eventually, did you get a job in Nashville? Yes, I got a job at a at a bar uh, called Betty's Bar and Grill on the west side of Nashville. And you heard yesterday, well, last week from um, Kelly Richardson. And how did you meet Kelly? I met Kelly online. He's got killers after him, so he puts his face online. He's worried about the safety of those close to him. So he decides to find someone to get close to. He wanted a job and a woman to use. And you start living with Kelly? Fairly quickly, yes. Were two in a relationship? Yes. Did she know who you were? No, she did not. And why didn't you tell her? I did not tell her because, again, in my mind, with how horrific the events of my mother's murder were, how graphic the people were capable of such insane violence, I had to believe that they would keep the word and take it out on my ex-wife and my children, if anything was said. So I 
adopted a new identity and I made a vow to myself that I would never reveal who I was. And there were many, many times I wanted to to Kelly, but I wanted to tell her that I was accused of a murder I did not commit, but I didn't because I didn't want to endanger her and I didn't want to endanger Janine and the kids. I guess we're all supposed to believe he made these sacrifices for everyone. Did anyone bring a violin to court? Now, Kelly, did you and Kelly ever have any problems either in violence or in No, no, absolutely not. She was telling us that around about the date when she got arrested, that she wanted you to move out or stay somewhere else. What was going on there? Kelly, at the time, was a PhD student in chemistry and she had a lot of work to do and she needed her space. It wasn't a relationship space, it was, hey, just go find somewhere else to be for a day or two so I can get my project done. That's all it was. Lies again. Her description was very different. Now, during, by that time, what happened to the car? I want to say it was the Wednesday or Thursday before I got arrested. I got arrested Monday, September 30th, 2019 in Nashville by the Marshals. I want to say Thursday the 26th, I woke up. I believe Kelly was already in class or at her lab, and the car was gone. What a vengeful piece of work. Kelly was not shown on camera when she testified because it would damage her career. He just gave her address to the world. I cut it out, which is why you won't hear it here. But he just injected it. I didn't know it, but apparently there were a lot of break-ins and um, learned after the fact that the car had been broken into and during investigation of it by the Vanderbilt police, the car got towed. And that's what ultimately led to my capture. So I woke up, walked out, the car was gone. So did you have anywhere to stay with the car being gone? Mm, not right off the bat, no. Tell us how you ended up getting arrested. Yeah, on that Monday, I was, um, the weather was starting to change in Nashville. It was getting cool at night. Um, I was walking in West Nashville in an area called Sylvan Park where Betty's was and a few other places that I knew. And there was the old Southern thrift shop, which I had bought good cheap clothes before. And I was just looking for a light jacket because I didn't have one. And as I was done browsing through the store, I didn't see one. I started to walk out. And next thing I knew, I was surrounded by five or six marshals. And my face was in the floor looking up at them. And they told me I was under arrest. So, Richard, getting back to February 1st. Yes. Absolutely not. I loved my mother. She stood by me. I'm not a violent person. Never laid a finger on anybody. Blah, blah, blah. The weather was cool. He can never just answer a question. Next is cross-examination. I will bring that to you as soon as I can. Thank you for listening. Okay. 